For centuries, the only people interested in the maps of Africa were traders and adventurers in search of ivory, ostrich feathers, precious stones, or slaves. In the 19th century, the expeditions of Burton and Speke to the source of the Nile and Livingston's to Victoria Falls stirred the imaginations of Europeans. Africa came to be seen as a land of adventure inhabited by the most extraordinary wild animals on Earth. That legendary Africa is now a thing of history books, except for a region in southern Africa that we're going to discover on board the Zambezi Queen. The Zambezi Queen is now sailing calmly along the Chobe River. Our voyage will then take us to the Okavango and Zambezi, three legendary rivers that define a unique natural preserve in the heart of Africa. The Chobe River, which marks the border between Botswana to the south and Zambia to the north, belongs to the same river system as the Okavango and Zambezi rivers. All three take their source in the highlands of northern Angola and converge in the heart of southern Africa. After a short morning on the river, the Zambezi Queen comes into view of the Chobe National Park. Botswana are descendants of the Tswanas, a Bantu ethnic group that came up from South Africa around the 12th century. Despite frequent tribal warfare, the region around the Chobe River remained under African control until the 19th century, when the British, who already controlled South Africa, extended their dominion over Botswana, while the Germans seized Namibia. These colonial conflicts didn't concern the people of this region. Then, as now, they continued coming from Namibia or Botswana to pass back and forth across the Chobe River, being careful, of course, to avoid the hippos.
From the plateau of the Chobe National Park, we can look down on the meanders of the river and the great Namibian plain beyond. Kebi, our guide, takes us onto one of the many trails that cross this 12,000 square kilometer park. Kebi knows the habits of every species living in the park. He didn't bring us to this spot to show us this buffalo staring inquisitively, neither this sable antelope with its magnificent horns. But a pack of African wild dogs. These canines with their scrawny shape are fearsome hunters. In packs of 10 to 20 animals, they attack gnus, antelope, and even zebras weighing over 300 kilos. With the fatigue of a hard night of hunting, they're plunged into a deep sleep. Not even a squeaking family of banded mongoose seem to disturb them. Uh, this way, uh, bended mongoose, uh, uh, they were just coming down to the water to, to drink, especially this time of the year. Uh, you know, it's very hot. Bended mongoose are actually uh, uh, carnivores, so they feed on, on meat. So they will take, you know, insects like uh, scorpions, they will even take frogs if they could find them. Uh, and uh, they mainly feed on, uh, on uh, dung beetles, of which are, you know, grabs, you know, they like the, the ones that you find right in the middle of the, of the bowl of the dung. So they will actually break it open and then eat the, uh, the, the grub inside. So uh, like this time of the year, there are no dung beetles because, uh, you know, there's no rain. So as soon as uh, it starts raining, there'll be a lot of uh, dung beetles here. So you see these, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, banded mongoose actually digging up for grubs and eat them. The park is home to a great number of animals. During the dry season, they take refuge from the scorching heat of the bush on the banks of the Chobe River, where they seek out watering holes. The 40,000 elephants of Chobe Park are the most diligent in carrying out this daily migration. Once they arrive at the little pools on the riverbank, the herds splash about like a bunch of children. Then they settle down for a delightful mud bath. This ritual is not only a pleasure, it's also a necessity. The elephant is a pachyderm, which means thick-skinned. Even though their skin is up to two centimeters thick, it is very fragile, and in particular, it's very dry. The absence of hair means no oily, sebaceous secretions, so elephants need to protect their skin by covering it with water, sand, or mud.
The day is drawing to a close. Still in the company of Kebi, we head for the large island anchored in the middle of the Chobe River. Buffalo, hippopotamus, and the elephants naturally readily plunge in and cross the river to graze on these rich green pastures. Elephants are actually very selective feeders. They know which type of, uh, uh, like part of the trees, they need to eat the, uh, at certain time of the, of the year. So like uh, during this time when there's actually less grass or no leaves on the trees, they tend to actually eat the roots of the, uh, of the grasses. So because they know this time of the year, uh, all the nutrients have been retained in the roots. So that's why you find that our elephants will actually get the grasses, you know, they will shake the grasses uh, off the sand. They, they're actually trying to, to get the sand off the, the grasses and then they will uh, clean a little bit of the roots and eat them. Every animal here has got his own niche. So buffaloes are, are predominantly grazers of which uh, they would feed on the grass. And uh, elephants, like I said, they are select feeders. They will feed on uh, different grasses, so they don't have any problem unless there were uh, predators around here. So that's when it's going to be a different, uh, you know, uh, uh, feeding system. So ends our first day in Botswana. The Zambezi Queen has gotten underway again. On the upper deck, we stand transfixed by the stunning spectacle passing before our eyes. Chobe River and the Zambezi Queen behind for a few days. We take a little plane from Kasan to Bain's Camp, a safari lodge in the heart of the Okavango Delta. Martin, our new guide, is going to take us to discover one of the most amazing spots on the planet. Oh, the dogs actually got its water mainly from Angola, coming from Angola in the highland of Angola. The rain that Angola receives, it comes down all the way down into the southern part of Botswana. But it has to get through Namibia into the Panhandle. And we actually now, we're actually on the tributary of the Okatango Dals. lost in the middle of the flooded plains. A riot of colors where brown mingles with green and yellow with blue. A miraculous river, the Okavango. 
It's also an ephemeral river, for it evaporates before even reaching the sea. The Okavango Delta, Africa of our dreams. You can't even tell how, how much it, it reduced down. It's, it depends on the amount of flood that we actually have. But like this year, uh, the water that we received was much bigger than any other flood for the last 10, 15 years ago. And therefore the big the, the dart itself grows much bigger. It covers different places where there was no water for the last 10, 15 years. That's one reason we say the dart is very, very dynamic because it changes again and again. Get back to our navigation through the reeds, a little slower now. Coming around a bend, we meet up with a lone bull elephant. We slide along the surface of this watery mirror, whose colors are changing every second under the glow of the setting sun. Here at Bain's camp, we follow the advice of the managers, Jackie and Justin, and spend the night on the deck of our bungalow. A sleep out, but with a mosquito net, of course. A night lulled by a chorus of croaking toads and grunting hippos, and a symphony of other African night sounds. An unforgettable experience. Following Justin and Jackie's example, we embark on a mokoro, the traditional dugout of the delta. Nowadays, they're made of resin, whereas they used to be carved out of natural wood. But not just any wood. There's some others, I mean, there's some special trees which are commonly used to make mokoro, like uh, uh, Kingilia africana, which is a sausage tree. We do have got uh, some other trees, like uh, marula tree. We do have um, some other trees, like uh, Jackalberry, which is known as an African ebony. So, but the most ones which is preferable to uh, make makoro here um, is a uh, sausage tree, because that can last for a long time. Commonly, I mean, it was found here by the tribe called the Bayei tribe, and uh, right in the middle of the delta, because uh, these people, there was no way how they can transport their goods, even to travel from one spot to another, because they were living by, they were farmers, and also they were, I mean, sort of growing crops and uh, doing hunting as well. I mean, before, before that, they were using some other things like uh, what we can maybe mention it as in a floaty islands, the ones which have been prepared, they were just prepare it from a paparash, paparash and also with some other sort of vegetations like a, a common reed, so they make it a sort of a big bundle of it and uh, float with it because it's light anyway, special paparash is light. Uh, that was the first um, transport which was used before this one. We advance slowly through the network of narrow channels that crisscross this part of the delta and arrive at the village of Tataba. Fishing, farming, arts and crafts, 
Their traditional activities are not enough to lift the village out of poverty. The inhabitants are now considering the safari lodges that practice ecotourism in the delta. Our visit gives Basil, a village elder, the chance to earn a little money by making mokoro poles for the guides of Bain's camp. To make the mokoro poles, I use the branches of the sausage tree. The poles should measure between 2.5 and 3 meters. The little fork at the end of the pole helps you pull it out of spots where there's mud or a lot of grass and weeds. I built this mokoro myself. It depends on the length, but to build a mokoro like mine takes about two months. Once it's built, you take it down to the river and leave it submerged in the water for about two weeks. Then you take it out and only then do you complete the construction. You take care of the finishing touches. Almost everybody in the village has a mokoro. Some villagers build their own, others buy theirs. They use it to go out fishing or to get to the different lodges in the region. Just as we're saying goodbye to Basile, he admits that he too would like to have a mokoro made of fiberglass. Until then, he, like all the old timers in the village, will have to make do with his old wooden mokoro. Our last night at the lodge. They bid us farewell with the traditional songs of Botswana. over the Okavango Delta once again, we're dazzled by the beauty of the landscape and the life force thriving before our eyes. We've arrived at the chief's camp in the heart of the Moremi Reserve, a vast territory that is home to most of Africa's major species, what are known as the Big Five, the lion, leopard, Cape buffalo, rhino, and naturally, the elephant. With, with animals like elephants, when they see us, they see us like one big unit. So they cannot distinguish a vehicle and other. Uh, sub-object that you get around. 
if you sit still then it's fine but the moment you make some the noise that is foreign they notice that and they move or if you want to challenge the elephant if you do something like standing up and it's gonna charge elephants are actually more mobile animals they can cover such a big area and some of the elephant can move into Namibia Angola Zimbabwe into Zambia some go, now, nowadays because there's so many elephants Botswana we have about 151,000 elephants but the land can support about 60,000 so they move some of them now moving into the into the Kalahari desert The park guides are all in constant radio contact, for safety's sake, but also to signal the whereabouts of certain animals. Thanks to one of these calls, we got the chance to see a second big fiber. Leopards are solitary animals. They live uh, singly, where you find mother, a female by herself, and males in one big territory. And the, one, the only time that you find a male and a female coming together, it's when, when the female is on oestrus. And this mother has to take care of these cubs until when they're about 18 months old. And this cub that we're looking at now, it's about plus minus 10 months. The mother sometimes, they, you see both this cub and the mother coming together. But she was separated from the mother about two months ago. Soft evening light bathes the savanna, where a certain peace and quiet seems to reign. But the GNU, like the Impala, are on the alert. They stay grouped, ready to react at the slightest sign of danger. Day breaks over chief's camp. The morning is one of the best times to observe animals. We set out with Kenosi in search of other big five animals. seen the elephants and the leopard, and now we don't have too much trouble finding buffalo. They often wander onto the lodge's landing strip, sometimes giving a good scare to the pilots. The buffalo like this spot, not to see the planes take off, but mainly to graze. We have the uh, same rainfall that falls within the Okapango Delta, but is what makes the different habitats out here. It's mostly that in some areas, we find the sand ridges, and into, if you go towards the rivers, you find a lot of clay that is drawn there. Uh, clay and sand actually can determine uh, what kind of plants they, we can find. And you find animals who tend to, uh, to go to areas where they find it, what kind of food they want. Like out here, elephants actually, they can move in any kind of the, the area. And also in the open plains, you find animals like wildebeest and, and tessabee. And also zebras, you find them mostly on the, those kind of environments. And on thickets, out here you find animals like kudu, giraffe, and impala live in open areas like these called the ecotones. Ecotone is an area between a 
like a, a thicket area and an open area. But predators like lions, they can move into different habitats uh, following the food, which will mainly be the heavy balls. And there's interaction between animals. Nothing goes into waste. You find even the hyenas into the area. The lions will kill, but the leftovers that are left by lions, hyenas will eat. And leopard will kill, then you find the vultures coming in and to eat onto what the, 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 the leopard has left over. It's all about the interaction and all making one home to function. Of course, we're eager to see the king of the beasts. But here, a pride of 15 females resting up from their morning hunt in the company of a male sporting a majestic mane is a sight that exceeds our expectations. We're not as lucky with the rhinos. In 1970, there were still 70,000 black rhinoceros in Africa. Hunted down for the supposed aphrodisiac powers of its horn, their population is now estimated at 4,000, with no more than 40 in Botswana. Our stay in the Okavango Delta is coming to an end. Thousands of insects, reptiles, amphibians, birds, more than 150 species of mammals, like the zebra with their amazing stripes. The Okavango is not only a remarkable natural sanctuary, but a gigantic laboratory of African biodiversity as well. Back on board the Zambezi Queen, we continue along the Chobe River. Now we're heading west, toward Namibia. meters uh, length and it is 40 which is which is eight eight meters width and uh, the draft of the boat is just 0 0.6 so it could get getting any shallow so it's not very deep it's less than a meter and um, it's suitable yes to cruise in the uh, Shobe River yeah most thing you have to watch is the shallows there are places, the other places we are very shallow but uh, it's not much dangerous because it all, um, on the bank of the rivers it's all sandy and you go sometimes grind the, the, in the sandy, there are no rocks, what I mean. And um, always the wind is another thing as well. Wind is, comes very strong and what you have to do, you have to make sure that you are putting more power and try to lean where the wind is coming. Thank you. 
Once the boat has been made fast to the mooring post in the middle of the river, we set out with Francis, one of the Zambezi Queen's young guides for the Namibian bank of the Chobe and Impalila Island. Small boats shuttle people back and forth across the river between Botswana and Namibia. Very few visitors venture this far from the Chobe National Park, where all the tourist facilities of the region are concentrated. This may explain the bizarre looking vehicle that picks us up to take us to the spot that Francis wants us to visit. After several bumpy kilometers, the driver drops us off in the middle of the bush, which means in the middle of nowhere. We stick with Francis, who eventually leads us to the foot of a gigantic baobab. The baobab tree is quite important for the country because it's helped a good law of providing young children babies. Once the children have been born, one of the family can come and take the leaves or the buds of the tree and put in a small dish so that that young baby can grow healthy and grow big. It's play a quite vital law for the local people who live in the country. mighty tree. With its impressive stature, the baobab dominates all the other trees of the bush and savanna. It is the object of many beliefs and superstitions. For a village, having one of these trees nearby is a blessing, a sign from the gods. So it's at the foot of this tree that the villagers of Kasenu gather when they have to make a decision, which is the case today. Tony, the owner of the Zambezi Queen, would like to add a visit to the village to the regular program of his cruises. A long discussion takes place with all the villagers attending. Each person has their say. The proposition appeals to them, so now it's just a question of time and money. All the discussions in the village take place beneath this tree. Any time there's a problem or a project, we call a meeting here. All the villagers get together because one sees better with two eyes than one. And two heads are better than one. That's why we have these meetings here, so that each person can express their opinion. We leave the village of Kasenu and head back to the Zambezi Queen. Way, we come upon a string of elephants swimming across the river.
Once they're closer to the bank, they finish the crossing on foot. Well, those who can touch the bottom. The other smaller ones forge ahead using their trunk as a snorkel. Enjoy these last moments on the river in the light of the setting sun. This last night of our cruise, the crew of the Zambezi Queen has organized a dinner on the riverbank, a soiree pulsing to the beat of the songs and dances of the local villagers. After this last morning on the river, we'll leave the waters of the Chobe for those of the Zambezi. We continue our voyage by car for a short stretch. Passing a long string of trucks, we arrive at Kazungula, the border post between Botswana and Zambia.
board a pontoon ferry to cross the Zambezi, which is more than 400 meters wide here. The city of Livingston, founded in 1905, was named in honor of the famous explorer. In 1911, it became the capital of northern Rhodesia, Zambia's name in colonial times. In 1935, the capital was moved to Lusaka. Livingston then became a quiet provincial capital, where the charm of the dwellings reminiscent of the colonial past mingles with the colorful bustle of the African markets. The boom in tourism brought to light the incredible natural riches around Livingston, starting with the majestic Zambezi. Two thousand five hundred kilometers long, the Zambezi is one of Africa's four great rivers, along with the Nile, the Congo, and the Niger. Its width and might are the source of many legends and traditions that are still in practice by the river-dwelling tribes. During rain season, when that area gets flooded, there is a ceremony that actually takes place in that area, the so-called Kuomboka ceremony. It's done by the Lozi people. That's when the water gets high, the people just actually try to shift from the lower lands onto the upper lands, taking the chief onto the upper land. The chief is actually called the Litunga. And they use very big boat, use, they use paddles to paddle it, about 500 people, 250 on the side, 250 on the side. And the boat that they use is called Narikwanda. David Livingston, who arrived in Southern Africa as a missionary, fell in love with this continent and set about exploring it little by little. It was during his first expedition in 1851 that he navigated the Zambezi for the first time. David Livingston had about three trips into Africa. What happens, he's, he discovered the river at the source, but now he wanted to know where the mouth was. So what he did, he started following the river in a dugout canoe called the Mokoro. As he was canoeing down, he just heard a noise from afar. And now he couldn't know what was there. thousand seven hundred meters long, 108 meters high, David Livingston gradually made his way up to the foot of Oatunya, the smoke that thunders. The first European to discover these breathtaking waterfalls, he was fascinated and dazzled by the sight. And in honor of the Queen of England, he christened them with the name of Victoria. Victoria. 